Okay, hello everyone, and welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. So I'm really happy to welcome you on this webinar, which uh, deals with uh, encapsulation. So the idea of this uh, webinar is that we are going to present you um, the method and the technology that we are using for encapsulation for different kind of application, from single cell encapsulation uh, compatible with fax to uh, encapsulation of active pharmaceutical ingredients into uh, biocompatible polymer, but also encapsulation of uh, biomaterials such as cells, uh, organoids, uh, bacteria inside uh, double emulsion and also inside hydrogel uh, beads, for example. So uh, before we start, we'll, be, uh, we'll just wait maybe one, two minutes to let time for the latecomer to join us. Uh, in the meantime, um, so the idea of this uh, webinar is that we have nice interaction. So uh, I encourage you to ask a lot of questions. Uh, it could be on the presentation itself. It could be also based on your application, specific uh, application and needs. So feel free to ask any type of question. We'll, we will be really happy to answer it. And uh, during the presentation, so uh, you will be able to use the, the Q&A panel. So it's at the bottom uh, of the Zoom uh, screen. So please use this, the Q&A panel to ask questions so we can have an overview of all the questions that you have asked. And uh, we will be able to answer it during the presentation uh, directly on the Q&A panel. But at the end, we will have also a Q&A session where we will um, uh, discuss about all the questions that you have asked and also answer it again. Please do not use the, um, the channel, uh, the discussion channel uh, to ask questions because uh, with the Q&A panel, we have all the list of the, uh, the questions so that will be better for us to do not miss any type of question. So uh, I think uh, we can start. So before we start, let me introduce you uh, the team who will be presenting today. So first of all, myself, my name is Adam Mezian. I'm working as a project manager at Fugent and uh, I'm uh, focusing on the encapsulation uh, droplet production in general. And I'm with uh, Yun Vitri. Yun Vitri is one of the co-inventor of the encapsulation uh, process and uh, device that we are going to present and he's working with us uh, today. So before uh, we go into the details of the, of the topic, uh, I wanted to uh, give you uh, an overview of this week that we are doing. So today we are going in general presentation of the, the method and the process that we are using for encapsulation. Uh, so this is the idea to have, let's say, the theoretic part of the encapsulation. But starting from tomorrow, we have also um, uh, organized a live demonstration week. That means we have a dedicated some slot to make live demonstration. And the idea is that after this webinar, if you are interested to have a specific demonstration of the platform for a certain application, if you want to have direct uh, interaction with us and discussion, uh, we will be able to organize everything so you can see directly the platform uh, see how does it work, uh, make an experiment with us, and also discuss about your application. So this is the idea. So we have a 14 slots available still, uh, tomorrow, Friday, next Monday, and next Tuesday. Tuesday. So for that, feel free to contact us at uh, contact at and we'll be happy to organize everything to make a, 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 a nice uh, demonstration and uh, discussion. Okay. So... Now, maybe a bit of, let's say, con context uh, for people who are not maybe aware about uh, microencapsulation. So basically, what is microencapsulation? Uh, microencapsulation is the, um, the integration of an active uh, ingredient uh, inside uh, microbeads, uh, microparticles, or a core shell microcapsule. And why are we doing that? So the objective of that is to um, encapsulate uh, for example, in pharma application uh, drugs to have a controlled release of the drug inside uh, a body uh, to have, instead of having, a, let's say, um, a, a huge uh, pike of uh, the release of the drug, the idea is to encapsulate the drugs inside a biocompatible polymer to control the degradation of the drugs during a long period of time. It could be days, it could be weeks. And then, which will lead to... Uh, um, uh, a release of the drugs at the same time. Uh, other uh, added value is that this microparticle, microcapsule can be functionalized 
so they can target a specific drug si um, specific site. For example, if you want to target specific uh, organs, uh, by functionalizing this microcapsule, we can uh, make sure that uh, the microcapsule will target a specific uh, organ and will release this, this uh, drug inside this organ instead of the whole body, for example. Also, the micro, uh, let's say, uh, bioreactor, the microcapsule, can be also a protection. So if you want to inject a specific microcapsule, but you want the microcapsule to target specific organ and not be, let's say, destroyed before, uh, in, during the physiological transport, uh, the micro, let's say, capsule, the shell of this, uh, of this capsule can protect the drug from enzymatic or acidic degradation, and then will be able to generate uh, a drug release only at the specific site. Other application, uh, such as uh, cell isolation for sorting and genotyping, uh, we will see how we can encapsulate cells, bacteria, inside double emission that will be used into flow, flow cytometer to be sorted and then recover only one, uh, the specific, let's say, double emission that contain the cells or the bacteria. And also other application for cell culture and uh, bacteria culture, organoids, uh, spheroids, a culture inside uh, hydrogel uh, microbes, for example. So this is an overview. Uh, there is many other opportunities with the microencapsulation, but that gives you a, a nice overview of what are the possibilities of microencapsulation. And microencapsulation can be done actually, depending on your application, in single or double emission. Today, uh, we would like to focus on double emission because it's a really promising method uh, with a huge potential that can be useful in different type of markets in cosmetic for toothpaste uh, manufacture uh, to encapsulate the fragrance and have a slow again and controlled release of fragrance during a long time in food for encapsulation of food supplements such as vitamin for example and control the release again uh, test masking as well in pharma as I said before encapsulation of drugs inside micro capsule to control the release of the of the drugs. Uh, to pro as a protection again, and to have a specific release of the drug inside a specific uh, organ or site. And in, let's say in research, mostly for phenotyping, uh, when you want to encapsulate a single cell, you want to study the, the cell at single cell level inside a, uh, a double emulsion that you will, be, you will sort at the end and then want to analyze what the cell has secreted, maybe in combination with another reagent. So this is also another uh, type of application. So why it's not that widespread? Actually, double emission is a huge, uh, let's say, uh, is a, has huge potential. But actually, the method to make double emission are quite difficult, uh, or they present also uh, limitations. So you can have different type of method to make double emission. The, let's say we have presented here the two uh, big ones. So the first one is the batch method or bulk method. The idea is pretty simple, is that you will pull, uh, put inside the bus two immiscible fluids and you will generate um, a force. Uh, uh, it could be a mechanical, it could be ultrasonic, for example. Here is a vortex to uh, make a mixing and generate emulsion. So this is something which is widespread because it's easy to handle and we can make a large amount of emulsion double emission. But the drawback here is that you're not controlling really precisely the, the emulsion production. You're not controlling the size. You're not controlling the encapsulation of the biological material. And at the end, you will recover uh, a sample with a huge polydispersity. That means that you have a lot of droplets that are not do not have the same size. And as we have seen before, actually having the same size is really important because the size will be directly uh, related to the release of uh, a drug uh, or an active ingredient. So it's really important to have the same size. So it's not a, a technique that we, it's really robust and reproducible. Uh, and you're not controlling really precisely the production. To overcome this limitation, microfidics appear as, as a good method. Uh, to uh, compare to the to the batch method, so as we, as we can see here, the idea of microfidic method is that we are going to use microfidic device called microfidic chips that will have a certain device to generate double emission. The idea here is that we have a first part 
a cross section that will allow to generate a primary emulsion. And we will have a second part, which is in terms of design the same, that will generate another emulsion. The idea is that we are going to cut and make a surface treatment on this part, uh, in the blue part, to have hydrophilic coating and then hydrophobic, hydrophobic coating. The idea here is that we will be able to generate water in oil emulsion, then oil in water. So at the end, we will recover a water in oil in water emulsion, so a double emulsion. So it's another technique that appears as, uh, let's say, an answer to the batch method, because like this, you can control more, let's say, precisely the droplet formation. However, it's kind of difficult to handle. At the end, you have a better control, so you, you have a good monodispersity, but it's not something which is really robust. Actually, doing a surface treatment can be hard to handle and hard to do, because on the same device, you need to do both coating on one part and on the other. And at the same time, a surface treatment can be uh, not progress because at the end, uh, it has a lifetime. So it's something which is uh, not reproducible. And that's why we have developed, uh, so Sequoia technology has developed the Redrop. So the Redrop is a device that allows to generate different type of emulsion in uh, answer to the current limitation of the current method for, genera uh, for generating emulsion. So the red drop is a device we'll go in detail after that allows to generate different type of emulsion. But the most, let's say, important part is that you can generate with the red drop different type of emulsion without no surface coating. And with the same device, you can make water in oil in water double emulsion and oil in water in oil double emulsion with the same device. So this is for double emulsion. Single emulsion is the same. We can make oil in water emulsion, such as polymer particles, PLGA, PLA for pharma application, alginate particles, which are most likely water and oil emulsion, alginate, agarose, ketosan, uh, hydrogel-based um, particles, and double emulsion, ketosan microcapsule, PLG again, but microcapsule, so we will have a shell, thin shell of polymer here. And uh, we can make different type of encapsulation, such as bacteria, cells, that we are going to, to present to, to today. Now let's go in detail to have a brief overview of how does it work actually. So I will go back to the single emulsion version to have, let's say, the basic uh, knowledge of the red drop. So the red drop is a, is a device. Uh, inside this device, you have a chamber. And inside this chamber, you have, if we zoom here, we have a nozzle, a line in front of a, an outlet capillary called the collection capillary. The idea is that we have the two capillaries that are emerged in the chamber. We are going to fill this chamber with a continuous phase, control the flow rate inside this chamber, and then we are going to inject the droplet phase and control the flow rate of the droplet phase. By controlling the continuous phase flow rate and the droplet phase flow rate, we will be able to generate a shear stress in three dimension all around surrounding the droplet phase that will allow us to generate monodispersed emulsion. So the advantage of this device is that as we have the continuous phase, which is always surrounding in all dimension the droplet phase, we do not have any problem of wettability for the droplet phase to the channel walls. That means that we can make different type of emission, water in oil emission type or oil in water emission uh, with the same device. So this is for the simple emission and for the double emission, Basically, it's the same. The only difference will be as at the inlet, we will have a different type of uh, nozzle. Here, if we focus, the principle is the same. The only difference is that we are going to have a nozzle which is composed of a nozzle inside another nozzle. We will have a nozzle containing the core phase that will generate the core droplet, and then uh, an, uh, another nozzle to carry the shell phase that will generate the shell droplet. And by making the same principle, we will be able to generate double emission the same way. And this generation of double emission and simple emission, so with this technique, we are able to generate droplets with a high encapsulation efficiency, higher than 95%, because as you can see, the core phase containing the, the active ingredient will be totally encapsulated inside the double emission or in the simple emission. We can generate high frequency, uh, up to kilohertz generation frequency of the droplet, 
double emission size and also single emission can be uh, generated from 25 micrometer up to 400 micrometer with, as you can see, a high monodispersity. So uh, the droplet are, has always the same size and we have a dispersion which is lower than 2%. So how um, practically uh, it's working. So the redrop is composed of two inserts, three, let's say three main elements, one insert with the injection that we can remove to change from, for example, simple emission to double emission nozzle, the body that will not change and contain the chamber, and then an outlet capillary called the collection capillary and with an insert. So the standard geometry of the double emission will allow us to generate double emission for, let's say, 90 up to 150 micrometers. So this is for the standard. But assuming that you want to have larger uh, double emission size, it is possible. Uh, the only difference will be to change the double emission nozzle and the collection capillary to have bigger uh, nozzle and bigger collection, collection capillary. And that will allow us the same way to generate uh, double emission coming from 150 up to 400 micrometer. On the opposite, for some application, you want to decrease the size of the double emission. For some application where, for example, you want to encapsulate cells or bacteria and you want to sort them into facts, uh, we need to decrease the size of the double emission. Uh, why is that? Is that because in the facts, or flow cytometer, you have a nozzle which has a certain size. So in order to avoid breaking of the double emission, you need to have a double emission which is smaller than the nozzle size. So to be compatible with that kind of application, we have developed another design. We, we call it counter nozzle. So the idea is to still have the same nozzle at the, as the inlet, so the double nozzle. But the difference is that at the outlet, instead of having a collection capillary, we have another nozzle that will allow us to increase the shear stress locally and generate smaller double emission with a higher uh, generation frequency. And that will allow us to target a double emission from 25 micrometer. So that was for the, let's say, generation part for the device itself, the double emission. But how do we get all the benefits of this double emission device? So it's really important to understand that for generating high monodispersed droplets, double emission or single emission, it's really important to have really stable uh, flow rates. So have a fluid handling system, which is really stable and, and precise. That's why we are um, proposing the fluid pressure controller. So how does it work? The idea is that we are going to have a pressure regulator. At the inlet, we are going to generate pressure. And we are going to control precisely the pressure inside the reservoir. The reservoir will be close we, thanks to a cap uh, that we have developed at uh, Sweden. And by, pressure, by regulating uh, the pressure inside the reservoir, we will be able to generate and control the flow rate that will go to a flow unit, flow sensor, that will allow us to have the measurement of the flow in real time. And then we are going to go to the chip itself, so the device, and we will be able to control the flow rates during all the experiments. So we are going to pressurize this reservoir. By pressurizing, we are generating a flow. The flow will go to the flow sensor to have the measure of the flow sensor in real time. And then we are controlling and we can adjust the pressure to have a specific flow rate during all the experiments. What are the added value of this technique is that if we focus on the, on the stability, it's really important when you are making double emission to, or single emission to have a really stable flow rate. Uh, why is that? Because a fluctuation of the flow rate will impact directly the double emission size and will generate more, let's say, polydispersity. If we compare a high precision syringe pump here compared to a uh, pressure controller, we can see that we have much more stable flow rate than uh, the syringe pump. Uh, when you are using a syringe pump in your lab, you are asking uh, a value, so you are putting an order, but you don't have in the um, real time the value of this, this flow rate. In fact, as the range point is based on mechanical action, you have some pulse that can impact if we focus di uh, directly the, the flow rate. So this has an impact to, to the experiment. Other impact is on the response time. When you are asking a flow rate, 
with the pressure controller, you have, um, let's say, fast response. While with the syringe pump, you have a response that can go higher up to two minutes at, at, at the worst case. But this is something which is really important because when you are using small, uh, simple, rare cell, expensive reagents, nano beads, for example, uh, you need to have uh, the all amount of the cells or the beads that you want to be encapsulated. You do not want to have a transition time where you will losing your, where you will lose these cells or nano beads. So this is really important to have a fast response for for that kind of application. So this control, precise control, allows us to have highly monodispersed double uh, emulsion production. And in the emission, that will allow us also to control the shell thickness, as we can see here, by playing precisely with the flow rate of the core and the shell phase. So this is a balance uh, between the core and the shell phase flow rate all the time. So we know that uh, here I presented the two technologies, but how does, we, does it work particularly? Particularly uh, a setup to making to make double emission or simple emission can be hard to handle for people who are not totally aware about microphysics. You have a lot of tubing, a lot of connection. We have uh, a device, uh, pressure controller, flow unit. So it can be really, uh, let's say, uh, time consuming to have a proper setup that is working well. That's why we have developed in collaboration with Sequoia, the encapsulation platform. So the idea of this platform is to gather all the equipment that you would need to make an encapsulation from pressure controller, flow sensor, the device uh, with the red wrap, uh, injection loop, an optical system that will allow you to not focus on the method and on the tubing part and take time on this part, but focusing on your, let's say, application, and you will be able to generate your, uh, let's say, your recipe with the same, uh, let's say, encapsulation efficiency, the same performances, high monodispersity, and the same results. So what kind of application can we target with this encapsulation platform? Different type, actually, as it is based on the red drop and the red drop is really versatile. We can make different type of uh, emulsion uh, in droplets and beads, such as hydrogel, example with alginate here, polymer, PLGA, uh, it could be PLA also. also. In double emulsion and microcapsule, we can have PLGA microcapsule, ketosan, which is an hydrogel as well, with an oily core. Polymetacrylate, which is a resin uh, with an aqueous core, the same with oily core, PEG-DA, and also multiple emulsion inside uh, an emulsion. And what type of material can I encapsulate with this uh, in this double emulsion, in this capsule, in these beads? Different types, actually, uh, soluble API, insoluble API, and biological materials such as cells, uh, bacteria, or spheroid organoids, depending on the size. So that's all for the overview of uh, the techniques and how does it work. And now uh, I will let Yoon talk a bit more about specific case studies, uh, specific application that uh, you could uh, also uh, work on. So Yoon, I'll, uh, I'll give you the lead. Thank you, Adam. So in the next part of the presentation, um, we'll discuss uh, about different use cases of the encryption platform um, with a focus on the body emission. Um, all these applications were developed with our partner Sequoia, and they uh, all have their own application note available on Fujian's website. This application note will have uh, much more data on how uh, the process and the encryption process was done. Okay, perfect. Um, so I wanted to come back uh, at the uh, Red Drop platform first. So um, of course, the encryption platform is compatible with the all Red Drop uh, that exist. Uh, so you can see the Red Drop at the top right uh, of the screen here. The Red Drop will go uh, right here on the right side of the encryption platform uh, within the visualization module that will allow you to uh, see how uh, double emissions are generated and be sure that everything works perfectly. Uh, on the left part, you will have uh, all the uh, pressure controller here, the reservoir here, 
and a set of valves that will allow to uh, switch from one uh, type of fluid to another type of fluid, which is really uh, mandatory when you do process like uh, PLG microcapsule or ketosan microcapsule. In the middle, uh, this is a, a new feature that we we had to the we add to the system, so an injection that will allow you to work with a low volume sample. So the the idea behind that is to really start the, the system with uh, standard fluids and then only use uh, small uh, samples as low as 50 microliter. The use of the injection loop will also provide two uh, additional benefits. It won't contaminate uh, the core fluidic pass, so all the mainly the, um, the flow unit, the, 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 the flow unit, and also it will reduce uh, the cellular sedimentation because uh, you will inject the, your cell samples uh, only at the injection time. The injection is a, a six ports connected, a six, uh, it's a rotary valve comprising six ports connected two by two. Port one of the valve is connected to the core phase of the red rock. Port two is connected to the uh, core phase of the uh, encapsulation platform. Port six and port three are connected to the injection loop. Port five is connected to the sample injection and port four is connected to the waste. When in position two, the loading position, port one and port two are connected mean directly, are connected together, and uh, it means that the red drop is directly connected to the encryption platform. It will allow you to start uh, to prime the system uh, with standard fluids. Um, as port five and six are connected together and port three and four are connected together, the sample can be injected in the loop when the uh, valve is in, in this position. When the red drop produces droplets in, in a stable manner, the valve will be switched to the position one, the so injection position. As port, the ports one and six are connected and the port two and three are connected together, the sample stored in the loop is then directly integrated in the flow path of the system. This allows the recapture of the sample with the red drop. So in this first case study, we encapsulate bacteria uh, in small double emission and then sort them with a fax. Uh, this case study was done in collaboration with the TWB and the TDI in Toulouse, in France. We would like to thank them for their time and expertise. So to produce double emission compatible with fax, we use a double emission red rock with a 30, 70, 45 uh, configuration. It means that the uh, uh, double emission nozzle presents a 30 micrometer uh, nozzle for the core phase, a 70 micrometer for the shell phase, and a 45 micrometer printer nozzle uh, in front of the uh, double nozzle. This configuration allows to produce double emission between 20 micrometer and 40 micrometer in diameter with a production rate up to 10 uh, kilohertz. In the case of uh, bacteria encapsulation, we, use, we produce double emission uh, with um, water with 2% of twin, 2% twin uh, as a continuous phase. So here, we use uh, desurf, so fluoridated oil uh, with surfactant in the shell phase here, and for the core phase, it was fluorescent E. coli uh, in culture media. And on the right, so you have the production here, but it's really difficult to, to see clearly. And on the right, you have the image that uh, shows the double emission flowing through the collection capillary. To give you an idea of the time that it takes to generate a sample with an encryption platform, the setup and priming of the red rock was performed in 30 minutes, while the encapsulation of one sample was performed in 30 minutes also, which results in one hour of experimental work. If you want to produce several samples per day, you simply repeat the operation procedure with the injection loop it will allow you to produce easily around 10 samples per day. After collection, the double emission were observed uh, with a microscope uh, to see how what we encapsulate, actually. And as you can see on the two pictures, you can see several populations. So you will have uh, here droplet double emission with uh, that are empty, with so only uh, media culture. Um, droplets that present here, for instance, a green color that are that correspond to the fluorescent signal of the fluorescent E. coli, and double emission that 
only have uh, biovitality in it, so bacteria, but they do not present any uh, fluorescence. The, D, the double emission produce have a mean diameter of 26 micrometer in this case. They present an external model dispersity with a, a coefficient of variation below 2%. Size and model dispersity of this uh, double emission are compatible with fax uh, requirements. For the fax screening, um, a MoFlo Atreus equalizer cell sorter from the cytometry platform of the Toulouse White Biotechnology have been used. The first step is to use flow cytometry to determine the population of interest, the population that needs to be sorted. So you, we, you can see it here, so it creates this population, the so drops. Then there is a second step to exclude uh, the drop, the do doublets, and to only select the single uh, double emission in the left part of the graph. Finally, um, the, the identification in this graph uh, will uh, allow to see uh, which droplet present a fluorescent signal and which aren't. Based on this graph and on this, on this data, we um, perform two sorting. <coughs> one to sort droplets having a fluorescent signal and one to sort droplets that do not present a fluorescent signal or have a low fluorescent signal. It is to be noted that the cell sorter display an estimation of the sorting efficiency. The value displayed was around 85% of sorting efficiency, which is very good. Now, after, sorting the, uh, after the sorting of the samples, we observe the produced double emission in microscopy to verify the content of the collected population. As you can see, in the sorting where we targeted, where we are targeting at the droplet with no fluorescent signal, we can find two populations of, dro of droplets. Some, so one population is empty double emission and one population is um, uh, double emission that contain uh, non-fluorescent E. coli. In the other sorting, where we targeted the droplets exhibiting a fluorescent signal, we can see that all of them exhibit a fluorescent signal with a varying intensity. We can conclude uh, with this that the facts was efficient in sorting the fluorescent population of bacteria among the non-fluorescent bacteria that were encapsulated in double emission. After this application in the field of biology, we will continue with the field of active pharmaceutical ingredient encapsulation in microcapsule. Encapsulation of API in a core shell microcapsule is of great interest for several purposes, including test and other masking, as well as the control release of drugs. Um, microcapsule with uh, PLGS shell is a good candidate for the encapsulation of water soluble compounds. The encapsulation platform can easily create this PLGA microparticle. For instance, here we produce PLGA microcapsule by first generating a water all water double emission with water plus PVA as a continuous phase, PLGA in solvent, so here is IPAC for the shell. And uh, in the core phase, we use PBS with blue dye. The emission is then collected in a uh, PBS pass. And the precipitation of PLGA will happen by solvent extraction. And then monodispersed mono uh, microcapsule will be formed. On the left, you can see uh, the microcapsule, microcapsule with the blue dye. And on the right, you can see the PLGA microcapsule with the fluorescent tagged peptide. To summarize, PLGA microcapsule allow to encapsulate water-soluble compounds such as peptide, protein, drug carrier. Uh, different solvents can be used for PLGA, such as IPAC or ethylastate. Um, and the drug release will be uh, performed by enzymatic trigger. On the other hand, to encapsulate uh, lipophile compounds, it requires a different type of microparticles. In this case, a microparticle consisting, consisting of a ketosan shell and an oil liquor is the perfect candidate. Thanks to the versatility of the red rock, the encapsulation platform can easily create this ketosan microcapsule. Here we produce ketosan microcapsule by first generating uh, an oil water oil double emission with uh, one octanal with 2% span 80 uh, for the continuous phase, 2% um, ketosan in water for the shell phase here and soybean oil with red dye in the core phase. 
After production, the ketone shell double emulsion are collected in a cross-linking bath of glutaraldehyde in hexane. The ketone will cross-link on the sheet based reaction. In the picture of the, uh, at the bottom, you can see uh, the evolution of the uh, cross-linking of the ketosan shell. Uh, it is to be noted that the ketosan microparticle presents a limited leakage uh, with less than 5% after 24 hours. To summarize, uh, ketosan microparticles allow to encapsulate lipophilic compounds uh, such as vitamin or liposolid API. It can also be used to encapsulate uh, volatile, volatile oil. Uh, and in the case of ketosan, the release of the encapsulated compound happens by acid trigger. In this last case study, we present a different type of microcapsule that are produced with a UV cross-linked shell. Here, we produce a polymer catacrylate uh, microcapsule by first producing an oil-water oil, -water oil uh, double emission with uh, water plus 320 as a continuous phase, uh, polymetacrylate in the shell phase, and an aqueous solution in the core phase. Then, while the double emission uh, are flowing in the outlet um, capillary of the red drop, a UV light is used to cross-link the shell. After that, some uh, microparticles are collected, microcapsules are collected in, in the bus. In this particular case, the core phase can either be an aqueous core, as you can see in the picture on the left, or an oily core. This case study demonstrates the adaptability of the encapsulation platform to handle another type of microcapsule pollution here with a UV uh, crosslink shell. Okay, now uh, it's time for the Q&A session. So feel free to ask your question. We already have some. So the first one is, how is it possible to do both water, oil, and water, and oil, water, oil with the same channels without any force crossing? Maybe I will let you, uh, you answer. Yeah. Yes, if we go back. Uh... Yes. We'll go back to this slide. Uh... Oh. Mm -hmm. It's a bit low, sorry. So, um, yes, if we almost there, yes, this would be perfect. So, actually, as the um, core phase never touch uh, the wall of the shell phase uh, part of the nozzle, and the shell phase part, uh, shell phase will never touch uh, um, the collecting capillaries. You don't need any surface treatment uh, to avoid the uh, wettability of the different phases one to another. It's really this uh, 3D axis geometry that allows uh, to do water in oil in water double emission or oil in water in oil in double emission. Of course, if you want to uh, switch from one formulation to another formulation, you have to first clean the red drop to remove all residue, and then uh, you can uh, start another uh, formulation. Can you have multiple inlets for the core in double emissions? Uh, that's a good, a good question. Uh, uh, on some application, you would uh, need sometimes to encapsulate uh, in your core cells and maybe micro, uh, nanoparticles, something like that. So this is something that we have done uh, also. Uh, so with the regular itself like this, you cannot have multiple um, inlets for the, the core uh, the core phase or the shell phase. But what can be done easily is to have, um, let's say, a T junction before the, um, the, 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 the generation of the, of the emission, so at the core inlet, that will uh, just be mixed. Yeah, that will just uh, be mixed inside uh, right before the core phase uh, inlet, and then you will be able to generate the mix of the two solutions, uh, for example, cells and nanoparticles inside your, the um, inside the core phase. Okay. 
it is the oh sorry so uh, it is it is this one yes so yeah here's a good example uh so so really the principle that is that we we had a t junction function that creates the uh, red dot you need uh, of course um, an extra uh, pressure um, based uh, controller and another uh, flow sensor to have the perfect mixing of your particles uh, and this will allow you to encapsulate uh, to to mix two reagents uh, before the the red dot and depending on the flow rate um, the the time between the mixing and the encapsulation should be lower than 15 seconds. So yeah, it's possible to have multiple inlets, uh, like this configuration. Another question is how many times a red drop macrophagic setup can be used before it needs to be replaced with a new one? Uh, actually, uh, the red drop is made to be uh, reused. So you can make different type of uh, experiments with the same device. The only thing is that if you are making uh, experiments with cells, with bacteria, what we recommend is to have a good cleaning process at end of any experiment to make sure to have no clogging, no, uh, let's say, uh, cells, dust, or something like that that can be uh, inside the, the channel after an experiment. So as long as you are working, let's say, properly, you are filtering the solution. Uh, by the way, in the platform, you ha also have filter, inline filter that allows to work in, let's say, a clean condition. So as long as you are working in a cleaning condition and in a clean uh, process, uh, you can reuse anytime you want. Yes, it is always difficult to to say the lifetime of the of the of a one red dot because it will really depend on what you do with it. Um, but for sure, if you are clean with it, it will last more than a year. Uh, we had some case with um, hardcore user, we'd call them, that uh, use the red drop uh, not in the in the best way uh, and with uh, with with chemicals uh, etc. And after one year of daily use, so it's really daily use. They use it all the all day, every day. I mean, not on Sunday and, and Saturday, but uh, all of the weekday. Um, after one year, they, they start to have uh, some small issue. And we, we were able to do a refurbish of the red drop. So you don't have to, to buy a new red drop. Either you can change only one part of the red drop, or you yeah. can uh, replace uh, two parts, etc. But it's not, not that you have to throw everything away. Uh, yeah. because the uh, uh, standard seed part can be reduced. Yeah, we have a support team who, who is dedicated to that. So if you have a nozzle clog, we can help you on that to clean it on your own. Or otherwise, we can um, make an exchange of only the nozzle, clean it, and uh, make sure that you are working in a proper condition. How long do cells survive in double emission droplets? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So um, during our experiment, we didn't uh, went uh, uh, to the um, uh, to the analyze of the surviving of the cells. Uh, I, I, I don't I don't have the answer about the experiment that we have made. However, usually if you are working with the cells and you are um, uh, encapsulating the cells in the right double emission, and after that you uh, for the facts, for example, experiments you do not have any breaking of the double emission and you put directly on the incubator, you have a huge, uh, let's say, a cell growth and it's working uh, usually well. Uh, after that, it depends on the application, it depends on the, on the, uh, on the um, let's say, reagent that you are using. But uh, usually you have a um, high, uh, let's say, um, uh, success rate with the cells. We have another question. Um, are the red drop chip and the flow sensor autoclavable? And is it possible to use solvent to clean the red drop channel? So I will speak for the red drop uh, chip. So yes, the red drop chip is autoclavable. We did uh, we did it one test with it. So we didn't do a lot of cycles of uh, autoclavage uh, to know the, li the, the limit, I would say, of the number of autoclaves. But it is possible to autoclave it. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can also use uh, solvents to clean the red drop channel as long as they, uh, they are in the uh, chemical compatibilities. compatibilities. Yeah. 
But for instance, for uh, the uh, LMP uh, process um, with mRNA, uh, Sequoia, our partner, used uh, RNA zap uh, to clean the red drop and to uh, be sure to perfect a uh, perfect uh, process. Yeah, and uh, if I can add, the red drop is made of a metacrylate nozzle, so you have a compatibility chart that uh, uh, can help you to choose the right solvent to use to clean. Uh, otherwise, there is also a possibility if you have any doubt. For example, we know that dichloromethane um, uh, can be hazardous for long-term experiments with the red drop. So if you absolutely want to use dichloromethane, uh, we can also provide a red drop made of glass nozzle, uh, which, is, uh, which is the same principle. The only thing is that the nozzle is in glass. So more compatibility. More compatibility. Ah, no, the, the flow sensor, uh, sorry, <laughs> the flow sensor are not autoclavable, no. But that's also one of the uh, goal of the um, of the um, injection loop. So if you need really to have something that is clean, uh, you will only have to clean the injection loop and the red drop, uh, and the, uh, the rest of the part can remain kind of uh, less clean, I would say. Yeah. Another question. Hello, can you tell us more on how to make sure the double emission droplet don't break during fax? I'm trying to do this and can't recover any double emission. Your image showing droplets before and after sorting are very nice. Can you point to any published article where they show that too? Um, so unfortunately, we didn't publish anything uh, on that. This is a collaboration with the TWDD um, that we have done. So this is a collaboration. We have developed an application note. Uh, you can uh, find the application note on our website. We can send you all the protocol, the material that we have used. But how do we make sure the double emission droplet don't break during fax? Actually, for this case, you can yeah. add if you want. Yeah. Uh, that was to have a, a small double emission, lower than 25 micrometer, yes. and uh, stable. Uh, so they can be uh, inject into the flow cytometer because inside the flow cytometer you have a nozzle, of course, and if the droplets, the double emission are, let's say, larger than the nozzle, it can be, uh, it, that will be broken. So that was the, the main challenge. More than that, actually. So uh, if, if I may, um, it will depend actually on the, uh, the facts that you have. Um, for instance, so um, the the fact that we used well, had a nozzle here of, of 19 micron, but I think it was a 150 like micron. Like and so you have to 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 produce droplets that are uh, at least one third of the diameter of the of the uh, nozzle of your fax, but below is better. Uh, and so that's why we we will we went to uh, double emission with a mean diameter of 26 micrometer. Of course, you have to a uh, first phase of uh, process optimization uh, to find the right size in terms of um, um, double emission diameter compatible with your fax. I would say because it really depends on one fax to another fax, uh, and also uh, adapt the uh, the flow rate of the encryption platform to have the senior shale. Uh, possible, but also uh, stable enough for the whole process. It's really a balance on all these parameters uh, to avoid any um, breakage of the devolution in the facts. But the, the, the main rule would be to have uh, the devolution I mean, at, at the minimum one third of the diameter of your nozzle. No problem. Another question is what surfactants are usually used in the oil phase in water oil water droplets? So um, during this experiment, we have used different type of uh, surfactants. Uh, we are providing at Fugent a surfactant called the g -surf that is really uh, uh, stable to make uh, double emission and have a stab nice stability with double emission. Uh, so we can provide a surfactant like this. Uh, we also, there is also other surfactant on the market, such as uh, the, um, the surfactant from MUCO that are really uh, useful and nice for uh, fax experiments. We have seen that as well. So uh, basically, this is surfactant for fluorinated oil. Uh, 
that are more compatible with uh, cells and bacteria. So this is uh, that kind of the two, let's say, uh, surfactant that we are using. But but you can use other type of oil. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th there is no limitation actually. So you can use any other type of oil uh, for your system. And of course, um, uh, the droplet size, double emission size that you will uh, achieve will vary from uh, from one formulation to another formulation. So if with floated oil, you can achieve 20 micrometer uh, droplet diameter. Maybe with another oil, you will uh, be able to only go up to, I mean, down to uh, 22, 23 micrometer in diameter. There is really an influence on the formulation on the droplet size. Uh, and so that's why we give range, uh, accessible range, because you can mostly you achieve all the range with the formulation. But in some case, one formulation, one specific formulation will be a bit more uh, restrictive and to be difficult to have the uh, perfect dilution that you want. So there is another question. How much does the instrument cost? Uh, so just uh, maybe to, to clarify. So here we will not talk about the uh, cost of, the, uh, of the, the instrument. If you want to have a specific uh, question, uh, regarding your application and also the cost of the instrument, I encourage you to uh, contact us so we can uh, either uh, make a one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting so you can have uh, really a clear vision of the, of, the, of the instruments and we will discuss about cost and uh, also capabilities at that time. Can, uh, another question, sorry, can the cells be taken out of the droplet afterwards? Uh... The answer is yes. Uh, there is several methods. Um, one can be directly uh, after the fab starting when it's collected on the plate, and the, the collection on the plate will break mm -hmm. uh, most of the time the double emission. So there are different way of doing it, and it's already uh, in the literature for most of them, I would say. And then it's really um, dependent on uh, one yeah. process to another process. So it's difficult to to give you a specific example with the process because it really depends on on the application. Yeah. Can two thick uh, shell make double emission droplets unsuitable for fax? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good. Uh, I will just finish. Based on your experiment, is there a maximum thickness of shell phase required for fax and flow cytometer? And how is that controlled with the platform? I'll let you so, so, sorry. <laughs> so yes, um, if the uh, shell of the um, double emission is too thick, uh, it will be an issue for the for the fax uh, because uh, threaded oil are heavy. And so the double emission will uh, and heavier than uh, than the water and the media, media culture, uh, media uh, media gross, uh, yes, media in wet. Um, and so the uh, double emission will start to sediment at the bottom of the vial, and it will be difficult for a fax to uh, pump them and flow them uh, through the through its uh, nozzle. Uh, that might be so. That might be an issue for that. It will also, um, I mean, kind of not coalescence itself but the uh, aggregate kind of aggregation yeah. of the uh, double emission and so they will arrive in a in a large amount through the nozzle and so they might break uh inside the nozzle so if the shell thickness is, is too is, uh, is too thick uh it will be an issue uh and also on the signal measurement if the shell uh is a is a shell is too thick it will also be an issue because the signal will be uh, less good um with the platform, it's uh, quite easy to um, adapt the uh, shell thickness. So actually, it's really by playing with the flow rate of both core phase and shell phase that you can adapt the uh, thickness. Um, we don't have picture here, but there is uh, plenty of picture in the different app notes uh, um, on Fidget website uh, that show uh, the, ah, yes. You okay. have one so, here. Yeah, we have one. Yes, so really by playing with the flow rate, you can uh, adjust the shell thickness uh, of your system. But of course, there is limitation. Uh, there is a minimum uh, shell thickness, a maximum shell thickness that you can achieve. And uh, this minimum and maximum will depend, so, so there is a ratio between the core phase and the uh, shell phase, will depend on the formulation. So it's not the geometry, mm -hmm. it's not the, 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 the pressure, et cetera. So it's really the formulation that could give you a limit. Yeah. Is it possible to use the red drop system to generate longer size deformed drops within the, the collecting tubing? 
a few milliliter long drops having same diameter as the tubing. So uh, actually, it is possible to have a projection of uh, emulsion that are larger than the outlet capillary. Uh, we can have uh, an outlet capillary which can go up to uh, 450 micrometer. So you can have uh, larger droplets. At, the, at that time, that will not be droplets in production in really stable, let's say, uh, a regime, but you will have like a deformed uh, plug, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to generate a uh, larger droplet than 500. Uh, we did, I didn't do any uh, milliliter droplets. No, I, I, actually, I don't think it will be stable because uh, when producing this type of plug flow, because it will be kind of a plug flow. Plug flow, yeah. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure that it will be stable because uh, um, uh, the core phase will start uh, touching, wetting the wall. Mm. And so you will have a different behavior uh, with the system. So uh, it might be possible, but I can't guarantee that yeah. it, it will work. So I've made more, uh, let's say, plug uh, droplet that was working well, but it was at a certain limit. So I can say that we can make 500 a bit uh, more than the 450 collecting capillary but uh, more than uh, in milliliter uh, regime, I, I would say that can be hard and tricky. Can you make 25 micrometer droplet with the 30, 70, 150 configuration? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so at that time, if you are fixed configuration, you need to play with the flow rate. At some point you will be limited in terms of flow rate to decrease the size of the double emission. So you will not be able to go down to 25 micrometer droplet. Uh, I think the minimum was on the 70, 80 yes. micrometer uh, with this configuration. So that's why we have the counter nozzle that allows to decrease the, the, the size of the double emission. But if you already have a 30, 70, 150 red drop, uh, depending on the on the age of the red drop, it can be possible to only replace uh, the output mm -hmm. insert and replace it with uh, a counter nozzle. Counter yeah. nozzle, yeah. Yeah. So as uh, I presented here, you can see that, for example, you have already have your nozzle 30, 70. You can Remove the outlet capillary and put a counter nozzle of 45 here, and you have your configuration for smaller double emission. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Um, Maybe I would like to go back to uh, this uh, week agenda as uh, uh, we had many questions uh, which were dedicated to, I think, your application and your interest. Uh, I encourage you to contact us uh, again to book a session uh, so you can see really uh, how does it work and uh, to discuss about your application. The idea is to have better interaction than uh, just writing on the, on the channels to have a uh, direct conversation and to see if uh, we can collaborate together on different type of, uh, of project together. Oh. So there is another question. Yes. Uh, is there a peak tubing after the flow sensor to create a flow resistance? So, so that's a good question. And the answer is yes. Um, so actually, you, you need to add uh, a certain flow resistance to the system to produce a, a stable uh, double emission uh, generation. If you, if you do not have enough um, pressure and flow resistance, and you work at first time something like 200 millibar or 300 millibar uh, as a, a pressure for to, to push the liquids, uh, you will be able to generate an emission. But then the system will be um, uh, unstable due to external perturbation. That's why it's better to add um, some resistance, uh, mainly in between the reservoir and the um, and the flow and the flow meter, uh, really far away from the red drop, far away from the cell, far away from everything, to really stabilize the system. And this, um, as a uh, encryption platform is uh, open, you can change it by yourself if you need to adapt it to your formulation.
Okay, so we are going to close the session. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this webinar. Uh, feel free to come back to us if you want to have a one-to-one -one, uh, session, and uh, we will be happy to to organize this uh, with you. So have a good day, and thank you again. Bye. Thank you.